You can see this uh, kind of a poopy tail that this animal got right here. So, uh, but I would say about, uh, so when I had about uh, 35 animals here, about 10% of my animals were having acidosis. And so that's where that, uh, th that poopy tail, if they got poop stuck to their tail like that, it's a good sign that they're having diarrhea. But ever since I kind of just uh, been fiddle farting with their diet and uh, implementing these corn stock bales, the acidosis has completely stopped. All of my animals are having a, are, are, are having a good bowel movements. I, I have zero acidosis issues at this point, so it's very good. Here in about three days, I'll be bringing in more animals. I'll have 50 animals here. I'll have 57 animals. So I have 10 animals here right now. Three of them are going to the cell barn on Monday. That leaves me with uh, seven left. And then I'll be bringing in 50. I'm going to take care of those 50. And then I'll probably bring in about 15 more. Uh, when they get about... So this is Big Boy over here. He's probably... I would say he's probably about... Uh, Oh, uh, well, okay, so he, I would say he's probably about 750 pounds, maybe a little bit more, but these, these are uh, black Angus heifers, two of them, the, the big, the, the, the big two ones, let me uh, get up on them, they'll let me get up on them, and, and they'll let me mess with them, and so uh, they'll, they'll let me, they'll let me get up on them, and I can, I can bear hug them, and so last year, one of the things that I did that I'm not doing this year, but last year, I used to measure my animals every week to get a uh, to get an idea of what their weight was because if you take a, if you take a tape measure and you wrap it around their their front legs like this around their chest and around their front legs and then you take the length of their body there's a there's an equation there's an equation that you can uh, just uh, punch into your calculator and it will give you an estimate body weight of the animal and it is very accurate i mean it is very very accurate and so last year uh, one of my calves, I weighed him every week. I, I weighed uh, three or four of my animals every week. And then I realized that when these animals hit about 550 pounds, that is at that point, I can no longer uh, bear hug them. So uh, up until they're about 550 pounds, I can actually reach my arm. Uh, I can actually reach my arms around their entire body. And so that that is how I estimate their weight now. Um, a few of these animals, the, the animals that let me uh, walk up on them and, and grab them, and they won't freak out. I, I just I, I walk up to them and I, and I and I bear hug them. And, and if I can't get my arms around them, then I know that they're probably over 550 pounds. Because last year when I was doing that measurement, it, it, it happened repeatedly. Uh, it happened uh, with several of my cattle when they hit about 550 pounds. That was when they were too large for me to bear hug them, to get the tape measure around them. And so the two big black Angus heifers that I have, I uh, I tried to bear hug them yesterday and they're too big for, for me to wrap my arms around. And so I would say my big animals are somewhere around uh, 600 to six, uh, about 600 to 650 pounds at this point. And well, they're they're about ready for market because my my plan right now like last year i took these animals from a two and a half to nine and a half a lot of these animals they ended up going to the cell barn at about 900 pounds uh somewhere between 800 to 900 pounds and i uh, i want to kind of reduce that to about seven to eight hundred so if i'm going to raise heifers I, I would like to take them to market when they're about seven to eight weight if i bring them in at three and a half i'll double their weight and take them to market and so uh, I have a few animals here that are already about ready to go to the market. I would say uh, here in about a, a month or two, uh, about a month, I'll have some ready uh, animals ready for market. And then in two months, I'll have some more animals ready for market. But I do have some uh, mar animals that are about ready to go to market. Uh, quit pushing the hay around. They're, 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 fin they're, they're pushing through the hay. To get through the to get to the corn but that's fine i don't i just don't want them throwing a whole bunch of hay on the ground trying to get to the corn but i had to get myself a wheelbarrow too here in about three days or it is on the third day that i will be bringing in my calves i'll be good to go once i get those 50 calves kind of just uh situated i'll probably be bringing in about 15 to 20 more so I'll probably put myself at maximum capacity. I don't really want to run more than 75 cattle on my 10 acres. Just because, it, well, I mean, my, my, my property here, realistically, if, if I'm going to run them small, if I'm going to run them at three and a half weight, 
I can probably raise about 120 cattle on my property. Just gonna be honest, I probably could. If they're that small, if they're three and a half wet, I could probably raise 120 of them here. But the problem is, is that they get bigger, right? Over time, they'll get bigger. And so if they go from three and a half and then they go up to seven, it's gonna be like they're taking up twice the space and it's gonna look like I have twice the cattle because they've gotten so much bigger. And so I'll probably, uh, keep my field at about 70 to 75 animals just so that there was enough space for uh, all these animals the animals are comfortable it's not like jam-packed i mean uh that's probably where where, where I'll, uh, I'll, I'll i'll probably stay at around 70 to 75 animals because at 70 to 75 animals when the animals are real small it's not going to look like there are many animals on my field. Like last year, I had, I had a, at one point, I had like 45 animals on my field. And, and you, you, I mean, you could barely even tell. I mean, I remember uh, like sometimes I would look out into my backyard and I couldn't even see my cattle because they were all the way in the back sitting at the trees. And I couldn't even see my cattle and I had 45 of them on the field. And so 70 is not going to be that big of a deal. I mean, uh, when these animals are, are, are out and about on the field, it's not going to look like I have that many animals. The animals will also be very small and so uh, yep I got here uh, in three days I, I'm probably I've been considering running these animals through a chute so when these animals when they first get here the my new lot of animals I probably run them through the chute and so I'm getting onboarding medication uh, uh, ready so when they get here it's like what do I want to do do I want to give them a pink eye vaccine do I want to put an insecticidal ear tag in their ear do I want to put uh, do I want to apply therapies you know well what are the things if I am going to run them through the shoot I'd like to run them through the shoot one time and the one time that I run them through the shoot I do everything that I need to for them because I don't want to run these animals through a shoot once twice three times you know that was one of the big mistakes that I made last year was because I didn't know what I was doing uh, well I mean uh it's not that I didn't know what I was doing but my plan wasn't very good and so if I had the animal in the shoot for a uh, for a uh a, uh, a a BRD vaccination and a uh, and a black leg vaccination and I was putting in an ear tag I should have probably also uh, like uh, uh, dewormed them on the spot why well, why well, I did deworm them on the spot but I, you know I could have changed out the ear tag I could have applied an insecticidal ear tag instead of a uh, instead of just a normal ear tag it would have been the same work for me it would have cost me about the same amount of money but i could have put an insecticidal ear tag in their ear and that would have helped me control the flies that would have given me another way to control the flies uh, i've been considering a, a pink eye vaccination but the pink eye vaccination uh well i've, I've been considering it's only, it's only a one dollar a dose but the thing about pink eyes that i i get is the like a one out of 30 of my animals or so get it i mean i would say about one out of 25 of my animals get it and so i don't really know if it's if it's a good idea for me to uh pink eye vaccinate all of my cattle you know it's probably better for me to just give the one animal out of 25 that gets pink eye a, a shot of antibiotics so uh, I'm, I'm 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 formulating a strategy for do i want to run these animals through a shoot when they first get here and if I do run them through a shoot the first, uh, the, when they first get here, what do I want to do for them, right? I want to make sure I get everything done at the same time so that I don't have to run the animals through a shoot constantly. But I'm good to go. I have a lot of money sitting uh, sitting in uh, in my bank account. I still have a lot of money sitting in my bank account. I got my 50 animals coming in. I've got a lot of hay sitting in the barn. I got a lot of hay sitting in the front yard. The diet that I have these animals on is uh, they, they are, are, are producing good poop. So I have zero signs of acidosis. I have zero signs of protein deficiencies. They uh, they are pooping a, a good a good amount of volume of fecal material. So I know that they're getting enough to eat. So things are going very uh, th things are, are are on track. I'm not going to say things are going very good because those are usually famous last words. But so far so good. And and but you know. Uh, I know that you know a lot of when, when people look at me and they go oh man well this guy must just be getting lucky uh five six seven eight nine ten times in a row but luck is is a is a is a uh, is something that broke people it's something that poor people believe in and you know at this level of uh, at this level of performance 
it's not really luck. I have to know what I'm doing to a large degree, right? It's it's not like oh man, I got lucky. Uh, I got lucky planting my grass at 0.75, you know, inches deep on a 50 on a 50 NPK uh, fertilizer with a 20 uh, with a 20 pound sulfur. Uh, you know, it's it's not like all this is luck. You know, I didn't just do all this stuff and and, and it just happened to turn out well because of luck, right? You know, I planted my seed at 0.75 inches deep at 100, 150 to 200 pounds of seed per acre. I put a 50 NPK sulfur, uh, 50 NPK fertilizer on my field with 20 with 20 pounds of sulfur. You know, these things I didn't. You know, I, I applied, I, I put the seed in the in the field when it, right before it was starting to rain. You know, and, and all these things, it's not just, it's not luck, right? I mean, to a large degree, I need to know what I'm doing, and so far, so good. It's kind of a stupid thing to say too, because. Like if I run a business, right, that makes me uh, $350,000 a year, and if I'm making mistakes left and right and left and right, and I just keep making mistakes, I'm not gonna run that $350,000 a year business for very long, or that $350,000 business a, uh, a year business is not gonna be making me $350,000 a year. You, you see what I'm saying? Uh, at a certain point, luck goes, luck is, is, is a concept for poor people. And so, you know, I need I need to stay on top of things. You know, uh, here, if, if I don't fertilize my grass, uh, my grass looks very good right now, but if I don't fertilize my grass before it starts raining next week, the amount, the volume of rain, because the, the weather channel, it changed up on me. It's saying that I have five, I, I have uh, five days next week where there's a 50% chance of rain. And so if the, okay, so if it rains, right, if it rains, but the sun comes out right afterwards, the ground will dry up faster than if it rains, if it's real cloudy and wet for five days. If it's real cloudy and wet for five days, the ground will stay wetter for longer than if it if it rains and then the rain, and then and then it suddenly gets a full-blown sunshine. The, the more sunshine, okay, so this is kind of a, just a, so plants, uh, people like we as human beings we don't really understand exactly how plants uptake water throughout the soil there's a theory on how plants uptake water through the soil and the and the leading theory on the uh the uptake of water by plants from the soil is that the uh, the plant has microscopic pores on its leaf material it has these small gas pores called stomata and these gas pores uh, they exchange uh, 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 they exchange gas with the atmosphere and so like it, let's say I have a little plant right here right and I got a plant and it's got this is a plant leaf all alongside the bottom of the plant leaf there are these tiny little pores these little openings on the leaf and as the atmosphere as the wind hits the plant it causes the wind to get pushed up against that plant and as the wind gets pushed up against that plant, you see how my finger is kind of dragging across the plant, right? That's called a gradient. So it's like sandpaper hitting sandpaper. As that wind hits the plant material, it kind of it kind of drags itself across the leaf and that is what causes the stuff like carbon dioxide to be taken up by the plant. And so plants uh, about a large a large percentage of the plant material is carbon. Uh, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, a lot of, uh, like, when, when we eat uh, plant material or when we eat, like, fruits and stuff and we get carbohydrates, the physical structure of a plant is largely made of carbon. And that carbon is, is actually absorbed as a gas through the atmosphere. So the atmosphere contains the carbon, and as the atmosphere hits the plant material and, and rubs up against the plant material via wind, it pushes that carbon up into the plant and so that those those small pores that are taking up the carbon they're also releasing water into the atmosphere and so that's that is the uh, the leading theory on how how plants take up uh, water is that the outside atmosphere is drier than the soil and so if the soil is more wet than the atmosphere the plant will the plant it's like sticking a piece of paper towel in water it, it will it will start to travel up the paper towel it, it won't just uh, like if you ever stick a piece of paper towel in water the paper towel the water will start going up the paper towel 
And so that is kind of the big leading theory on how water is taken up by plants. Uh, we don't know for sure. Humanity doesn't know for sure, but that's the leading theory. And so if the outside atmosphere is very humid, if there's a lot of moisture in the air, if there's not, and, uh, and plants, uh, they, their, uh, their metabolic activity, when, they, when, when the sunlight passes through the plant material and hits the chlorophyll cell and goes through the chlorophyll cell, it will cause the chlorophyll cell to react in a way that causes the production of sugar. And so the more sunlight there is, the more, the more activity that there is in the plant, the more metabolic activity there is in the plant. So if, there, if there's a lot of sunshine, the plant will be metabolizing the environment faster than if there was less sunshine. Up to a certain degree, sunshine, if there's too much sunshine, it can also cause the plant to die. If there's too little sunshine, the plant can also die because there's not enough, uh, uh, depending on, on the plant and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, like uh, cacti can, can, uh, can withstand more sunlight than grass, et cetera, et cetera. So there are all sorts of plants. But uh, if there's more moisture in the soil, for a long, if, if there's less sunshine and more moisture in the field over a longer period of time, the plant will metabolize the, uh, the, the plant's metabolic activity will be different. And so if, it, if there's five days of very, very thick clouds and there is a, uh, and there is a, a rain event that drops, uh, you know, that, that saturates the soil, the, you know, uh, one or two inches of rain, the, uh, well, I mean, it doesn't really change up the things that I need to do. But it does give me an opportunity to put me a little bit more fertilizer on on the plant material because if there's more moisture in the soil and the uh, the plants are getting a lot of water and there is uh, to a large degree, I mean, it, the plants don't need 100% sunshine to metabolize at their maximum rate. I mean, even if we had you know a, a bit of a cloud cover, uh, uh you know, uh, four or five hours of the day a lot of the, there would still be enough more than likely still be enough sunshine for the plant material to metabolize at, at, at an optimal rate etc etc so you know i probably will put a little bit more fertilizer on my field than i would have originally so instead of uh doing a 30 35 pounds i may do a 35 40 pounds so i, I probably increase the amount of fertilizer that i apply on my soil by a few pounds just because i am in uh October, November, months like these, I do I do tend to get a good bit of rain and I do tend to get rain pretty often. So it gives me more opportunities to put fertilizer on my field. But if I'm going to get five days of rain the moment after I bring in these animals, I need to make sure that my animals are situated correctly because the moment they get here, it's good, the weather's going to turn real bad on them and I don't want them getting sick. And so I have a, I have a bale of soybeans sitting outside, a round bale of soybean that I'm sitting uh, that's sitting outside right now that I'm holding on to because I don't want to feed it until these animals uh, get here. And when the animals get here, I'll uh, I'll feed it to them. I'll give it to them as a free choice hay so that they get uh, they they can eat as much of it as they want. And uh, the diet, the, the total mixed ration that I have these animals on is going very well. I actually uh, kept these animals off of uh, off of any grass for about the past two or three days while I had this peanut hay put away. Maybe the past uh, about two days. I don't I don't know exactly when I brought in the peanut hay, but ever since I brought in the peanut hay, I took the animals off of grass and I put them on a total mixed ration to see what the ration is, is doing to them. And the ration is going very well. The ration that I am providing to these animals is, 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 uh, is passing through their digestive system very well. And uh, I was taking a look at them this morning and they were all pooping very good. And I led them out into the front pasture to get some grass. And so the, the, the total mixed ration that I have these animals on is uh, is very good um the total mixed ration that i have these animals on i'll give y'all a uh, a little thing or a a list of what i feed these animals just because maybe it will help somebody somewhere but i put these animals on free choice corn stock bales so i put i put round bales of corn stock uh, hay out i feed them a uh, one to 1.5 percent of their body weight or uh, in or or excuse me uh, two uh, about two and a half percent of the so I want them uh, or you know that is correct I, I feed them about one and a half percent of their body weight 
in a in either corn or in a mixture of corn and um and uh and peanut hay uh, i don't have this listed i should have probably listed this out before i told y'all because i uh i feed them uh one uh about about 70 pounds so i have 10 animals here and i feed them about uh about 70 pounds of peanut hay i feed them about 70 pounds of peanut hay a day and i feed them about uh about 50 pounds of corn a day too and so I feed them about 70 pounds of peanut hay, about 50 pounds of corn, and then I give them a free choice corn stock bale. And I, I and I anticipate that the average weight of my herd is somewhere around 600 pounds right now. And so they're getting, I'm getting, a, I'm, I'm putting about 2% of their whole feed a day in front of them, about 2% of their body weight a day of, in feed in front of them. And then I'm giving them corn stock bales to choose uh, to eat free choice. So the, the, that, that is the, the diet that I'm giving them. About 2% of their body weight a day I am giving to them as a total mixed ration. And the ration is a, is a commodity corn that is about 8 to 9% protein, about 85, 90% TDN. I mix it with a peanut hay that is about 7 pounds, or that, that is about 18% protein at about 65% TDN. I feed them a free, a free, a free choice corn stock bales, and then I mix in uh, uh, about a, about a three small handfuls of a uh, of a four to one calcium phosphorus mineral supplement that has altosid in it, and it also has all of the the little the little uh, nutrients in it, all like a uh, like a uh, 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 copper, selenium, uh, everything else. Uh, there, there's a, a salt, everything. So it's like a, it's like a nutrient. It's like a mineral mix that I mix into their feed. And I, and I feed them that, uh, that mineral, uh, that mineral. And, but you know, when I talk about feed, if I had to feed these animals like this on a daily basis, 24 seven, every single day, it's not, you know, I would not run this business. It's not a good idea to run this business. I'm gonna just be honest. You know, if you go, oh my God, you know, I can just go and buy this feed and, and it's going to be rainbows and sunshine for me and it's going to be easy for me. And, and you know, and, and I can and I can go skipping off into the sunset, making myself $350,000 a year. And it's not going to be easy because if, if you if you if you rely entirely like if I had to rely entirely on feeding these animals a total mixed ration every single day of the week. I, I, I wouldn't run this business. I mean, my money, I mean, it, the the, mon the amount of money that I make, it just would not be worth it, right? I mean, why would I run this business and make myself, you know, a hundred, hundred dollars an animal? You know, the, it just would not be, it, it would not be a good idea. You know, if, if I made $100 an animal, I would be miserable, right? On this small little farm that I have here, I would rather just go you know, because this takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of work. I mean, these animals, they need to be taken care of for. It's like having a whole bunch of babies. Like when I bring these animals in and they're three and a half weight, it's like having a whole bunch of children. I mean, you know, if you don't feed them just right, they're going to get sick. And if they get sick, it's going to be it's going to get real bad real fast. They're going to start dropping dead real quick. I mean, it's it's real bad. And so I wouldn't run this business if 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 if, it, if I could only make one hundred dollars an animal, right? Like last year, I made probably close to seven hundred fifty, a thousand dollars an animal, net profit. Well, uh, probably closer to seven hundred fifty. But if my numbers don't look like that, I wouldn't run the business. I mean, why would I run the business, right? And so, you know, uh, uh, be very careful. You know, I I may tell you what I'm feeding these animals, and and you could copy and paste it. But if you copy and paste it and then that, that's your big idea and you're just going to go, oh, well, I'll just copy and paste this feed plan and I'll bring in a whole bunch of animals and I can go skipping off into the sunset. You're going to have a miserable time. You're going to find out that running cattle is very difficult. Your animals are going to get sick and then you're going to have to give them all medication. At the end of the day, you're going to maybe make, if you're fortunate, you'll make 100, uh, 100 to $200 an animal. If the cattle market doesn't go very well, you can start losing money. You have to learn how to grow grass. I mean, if I didn't know how to grow grass, I couldn't make money. I couldn't make money at all. I mean, the, the amount of money that I could make, it wouldn't be worth it for me. I wouldn't run this business. It, it just it would just be a horrible investment of my time. And so the grass is what makes me money. But with that being said, I feed these animals. That's how I feed these animals. I feed them about uh, about uh, about a. Uh, 
about seven pounds of, of peanut hay each a day. I feed them about seven pounds of corn each, or, or excuse me, I feed them about five pounds of corn each day, uh, uh, five pounds of corn a head each day. I feed them about seven pounds of, of peanut hay uh, a head each day. I give them free choice corn stock bales as roughage material, and then I let them out on the grass for about an hour a day. And that's what my animals are on. And then the corn, I mix it with a four to one calcium phosphorus mineral supplement that also has the other stuff in it, like salt, selenium, copper, all that other stuff. It has that stuff in it. And so it's like a mineral pack for these animals. And I, and I mix that in with their corn. And the reason that I'm, I mix in a four to one calcium phosphorus mineral supplement with altosid in it is because the, the phosphorus, you know, uh, corn is known to have a lot of phosphorus in it and, and lack calcium. And so that's why I, uh, I, you really want to keep their calcium phosphorus ratio at about two to one. And so the, uh, the corn stock bells has a lot of calcium in it. Uh, the peanut hay has a lot of calcium in it. The, the four little small handfuls of, uh, of, uh, of of mineral supplement that I put on their feed it's just to add a little bit more calcium into their into their food and gives them all their little minerals and stuff and it also puts altosid in in their feed and altosid is just another way for me to control flies uh, if you're gonna run seven eight nine ten cattle an acre like me you're going to need to control the flies you're going to need to have a lot of fly control you're gonna want to put fly control in their feed you're gonna want to spray them you know, uh, you're going to want to spray them with insecticide. Uh, you know, just put it in a spray bottle and walk up to them and spray them. But don't do it if your animals don't like you. Because if your animals don't like you and you walk up to them and you try and spray them, they could end up kicking you. Uh, you know, uh, you know. Uh, one another thing that I'm considering is uh, putting uh, is putting insecticidal ear tags in their ears. You're going to have to control the flies. You're going to have to control the flies. But, uh, yep, that, uh... I mean, at least I do, you know, I, I know from experience that, that if I don't control the flies, the flies just, they just, they just get all over these animals and the animals live just miserably. I mean, you'll, you'll see them start to start to just being miserable because they have so many flies on them. So you want to, you know, I, I always make sure that I keep the fly, the fly, can, the fly population in, 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 you know, under control. Cause I mean, look at my cattle, right? My cattle don't have, maybe, maybe there are uh 10 10 flies on, on, on an animal right on you don't you can't even see the flies right but that's why that is because i do a lot to keep the flies off of my spray them i feed them i feed them an insect growth regulator and at this point if i'm going to run them through a shoot i'm also considering putting insecticidal ear tags in their ears but there's a lot of stuff that goes on uh, you don't really want a whole lot of flies because one thing that i found out was that if, if you have a whole lot of flies on your field the flies, they are going to spread warts and stuff like that. Uh, the, the fly bites will spread warts on the animals and, and, and all sorts of problems. And, and it, it'll spread pink eye. And there's a lot of issues that happen. But that's it for me today, YouTube. Y'all have a good one.